forward. Members of Congress in the House, anyway, were removing their congressional pins so they wouldn't be identified by the mob as they tried to escape the violence. Our new chaplain got up and said a prayer for us, and we were told to put our gas masks on. And then there was a sound I will never forget, the sound of pounding on the door like a battering the most haunting sound I ever heard, and I will never forget it. House impeachment manager Jamie Raskin today retelling his account of the Capitol attack, how he was there with his family the day after they buried Raskin's 25-year-old son, overcome with emotion, retelling his conversation with his daughter, who was there when it all unfolded. I told her how sorry I was, and I promised her that it would not be like this again the next time she came back to the Capitol with me. And you know what she said? She said, Dad, I don't want to come back to the Capitol. <laughs> of all the terrible, brutal things I saw and I heard on that day, and since then, that one hit me the hardest. An unprecedented second impeachment trial casting its shadow over a divided Washington tonight. Both sides arguing if the other side wins, it would set a dangerous precedent. If you missed any of the trial today, we have you covered tonight. The former president facing a trial in the Senate, but he doesn't appear to be ending there. His words and actions during and even before his presidency now under scrutiny. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh that you've recalculated. Tonight, the mounting legal issues facing Donald Trump, the private citizen. I think it's very possible that in the near future, we could see a criminal indictment filed against former President Donald Trump. Terrifying shooting at a health clinic in Minnesota, leaving at least five patients injured. Improvised explosives were also involved in the attack as we learn more about the alleged gunman. The race to vaccinate tens of millions of Americans. One million doses sent to thousands of major pharmacy locations across the country. One company's website crashing today from so many trying to schedule appointments. And the Biden administration revealing new distribution plans, including FEMA mobile units. Searching for the source. How did the coronavirus begin infecting humans? Retracing its steps in China as scientists address a conspiracy theory that the virus escaped from a lab where it was being developed. And the difficult balance between health and education. Parents and children, some of whom have been out of the classroom now for more than a year, are worried that students are getting left behind. So teachers and unions argue it's simply not safe. Threats of lawsuits, finger pointing, and speech making won't help. Let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. An unprecedented second impeachment trial now underway. And the question debated for hours today, is this trial constitutional? Both sides went back to the intentions and the language of a document ratified into law 234 years ago, the bedrock of our democracy, the Constitution. One senator calling it the most consequential vote of his career. One of Trump's attorneys calling the trial an affront to the Constitution, a tool to disenfranchise and pure raw misguided partisanship. While the House impeachment managers argue there is no January exception, saying the correct interpretation of the Constitution is that impeachment includes former officials and that there is precedent to support that. One issue that both sides agree upon, that the potential outcome of this trial is dangerous. When the dust settled late today, 56 senators, including six Republicans, voted to proceed with the trial. Our congressional correspondent Rachel Scott leads us off tonight with more on day one of the trial and what what comes next? Tonight, history made in Washington. The first time a president faces a second impeachment trial, and the first time a president is tried after leaving office. Everybody in! This way, this way. And today, Democrats wasted no time making their case against Donald Trump, forcing senators to relive the harrowing moments from one month ago, sitting in the very chamber that came under attack. Out 
impeachment managers playing a graphic 13-minute video, reminding senators what the president told his supporters right before the Capitol siege. We fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Trying to link Trump's own words and the weeks and hours before the deadly riots to the chaos that then played out in the Capitol. Senators watching in rapt silence. You ask what a high crime and misdemeanor is under our Constitution? That's a high crime and misdemeanor. If that's not an impeachable offense, then there is no such thing. Lead prosecutor Representative Jamie Raskin growing emotional. Members of his family were with him that day at the Capitol, recalling what his daughter said to him. And you know what she said? She said, Dad, I don't want to come back to the Capitol. <laughs> Democrats argue the Constitution is on their side and say even though Trump is no longer the president, he should still be held accountable for his actions in the final weeks of his presidency. Asking if they don't hold him accountable, what could future presidents do in their final weeks? Insisting in their words, there should be no January exception. What you experienced that day, what we experienced that day, what our country experienced that day is the framers' worst nightmare come to life. Presidents can't inflame insurrection in their final weeks and then walk away like nothing happened. Then the former president's team. Lead defense attorney Bruce Castor denouncing the insurrection, insisting those responsible are criminals and should be prosecuted to the furthest extent of the law, but arguing Trump is not one of them. We can't possibly be suggesting that we punish people for political speech in this country. The defense saying since Trump was removed from the White House by voters, the Democrats' case has no ground and that it's unconstitutional to hold an impeachment trial for a former president. For a great many Americans see this process for exactly what it is, a chance by a group of partisan politicians seeking to eliminate Donald Trump from the American political scene. And after four hours of arguments, six Republicans siding with Democrats, voting the trial should move forward. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, it's still an uphill battle, though, for Democrats trying to get those 17 Republican votes that they need. But just give us a sense of how today's arguments played on both sides of the aisle. Well, it's going to be a significant challenge, Lindsay, but inside of that chamber, when House Democrats played that 13-minute long video, it was complete silence. The chaos and the violence echoing inside of the chamber. Senators Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins, two Republicans, were spotted taking extensive notes. But even if Republicans found that presentation by the Democrats compelling, there is still the question of whether or not there is going to be enough support. 17 Republicans in order to convict tonight, Lindsay, that still seems unlikely. Certainly does. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Let's turn now to our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. And John, we saw one Republican senator did actually change his vote on the question of whether this trial is constitutional. Let's take a listen to what Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy had to say after hearing both sides. President Trump's team were disorganized. They did everything they could but to talk about the question at hand. And when they talked about it, they kind of glided over it, almost as if they were embarrassed of their arguments. Now, if I'm an impartial juror, and one side's doing a great job, and the other side's doing a terrible job on the issue at hand, as an impartial juror, I'm going to vote for the side that did the good job. And the question now is, how many impartial jurors are there? Really some tough words there. And we're hearing that former President Trump also wasn't happy with his defense. I'm told that Donald Trump was not happy with the opening arguments of his defense team, particularly uh, the opening presentation by his lawyer, Bruce Castor. Uh, the president, I'm told, was stunned by that presentation, especially when Castor actually complimented Democrats. Other Republicans close to Donald Trump called his legal team's presentation an unmitigated disaster. And I am sure, Lindsay, that Donald Trump is furious to see Senator Cassidy become now the 
sixth Republican to call this effectively a legitimate impeachment proceeding. But at the end of the day, even all that after all that went down, uh, the bottom line remains that you have 44 Republicans that voted today to call this an unconstitutional proceeding. 44 Republicans, that is more than enough uh, to win Donald Trump an acquittal in this uh, in this trial. In the meanwhile, President Biden today said that he's not watching the trial at all. Uh, no, that's what he's saying, and uh, they are making a very big point that he's got a very busy schedule this week. Uh, he is obviously just in the first part of his first hundred days. He's got a lot of uh, a legislative agenda that he wants to see work through the Senate. Uh, he's got more cabinet nominees that he uh, that the Senate needs to confirm. Uh, the one thing that Biden cares about above all else when it comes to this Senate proceeding is that it's done quickly. He wants this trial over with uh, as, as soon as possible. All right, Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. And now let's bring in Cardozo Law Professor and ABC News legal contributor Kate Shaw. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Kate, help us break all this down. You listened to all the arguments this afternoon that were presented. Both sides cited the Constitution repeatedly. The general consensus seems to be that the House managers were more effective at making their argument today. Would you agree with that assessment? And if so, what could Trump's team have done better? I do agree with that assessment, Lindsay. You know, the House managers led by Jamie Raskin, I think were really effective in taking what could be this sort of dry jurisdictional argument, right? Does the Senate have the power to hold this trial now um, and to breathe life into it, right? So, of course, they played that 13-minute video um, that, you know, either reminded people or in some, some cases probably informed people for the first time of what actually transpired on January 6th. Um, and, you know, they took on some of the consequences of the argument that uh, President President Trump's lawyers are making, which is that this trial can't happen now, and basically suggested that the upshot of that argument is that presidential misconduct, even of the most egregious sort, can't be addressed through the impeachment process if it happens late enough in a president's term. So Raskin in particular repeatedly underscored that the president takes the oath of office and is accountable from the first day, from his first day in office until his last day in office, and he repeatedly uh, reminded listeners that there's no January exception uh, from the oath of office. So I, I did think that he very effectively, you know, used the kind of constitution, but also talked about the stakes and about accountability. Um, the president's team was pretty muddled and meandering. Um, they, of course, did make reference to the constitution, but it was at points difficult to, to really track what the arguments uh, were. It seemed uh, at many points as though the argument was that impeachment in general is constitutionally suspect. And of course, impeachment is a constitutional process. It it can't itself violate the Constitution. So there was a repeated suggestion that because what the disqualification remedy does, so remember, impeachment can remove an official from office, but it can also disqualify an official from future office holding, and that's what the managers here are seeking to do. So the president's team seemed to be suggesting that disqualification was inconsistent with democracy because it took from the people the choice uh, whom to lead them. But again, it's a remedy the Constitution itself creates. Um, so it seemed as though they were simply uh, arguing that the Constitution shouldn't make this remedy uh, possible, but of course it does. Looking now to what comes next, each senator has committed to be a juror in this trial, which will, of course, uh, now move forward. For the 44 Republicans who voted that the trial is not constitutional, are they obligated to now consider the evidence and vote on the merits of the case, or can Republicans still say, listen, we didn't think that this trial was constitutional from the beginning, so legally it does not matter what Trump did and what his role was? Yeah. You know, I do think that they should, consistent with their oath to do impartial justice, remember they take a different oath when they sit as jurors in an impeachment trial. So consistent with that, I do think that they should proceed to listen to the evidence. The jurisdictional arguments were made and the Senate as a body rejected the argument that it didn't have the power to hold this trial. So it seems to me they should then proceed to actually consider what the evidence shows as to whether uh, former President Trump committed high crimes and misdemeanors, committed incitement of insurrection, and should be convicted and potentially disqualified. But, you know, there aren't any clear rules of the road here. So uh, definitely, if the senators want to say, we are going to vote to acquit based on these procedural concerns, based on the timing concern, there's nothing that prevents them from doing it. Uh, but I do think it would be more faithful to the kind of duty that they, their, to their duty as, you know, both kind of, you know, judge and jury in this instance, to actually listen to the evidence because the Senate has spoken as to the permissibility of the trial happening now. And lastly, some legal scholars are suggesting 
suggesting that Republicans may have another tool in their arsenal to potentially avoid a very politically challenging vote. They could simply not show up to vote, thus allowing a, a conviction with far fewer than 67 votes. What does the Constitution say with regard to that? You know, it's an interesting question. The Constitution says conviction requires a two-thirds vote of the senators present. So it's not, it, it certainly, it seems textually possible that if the denominator is reduced because a lot of senators don't show up to vote, well, certainly it seems to follow that the numerator would be reduced. So you could convict, say, just the Democrats show up and two-thirds, you know, probably all of them vote to convict, then that is, you know, well above the two-thirds threshold. Um, so I don't, there's certainly no precedent for it that I'm aware of, and I don't know that any senators have you know, indicated any interest in this approach. But it is an interesting possibility, and I think it does speak to, you know, the desire probably on the part of some Republican senators um, to avoid a difficult vote, but also to avoid appearing uh, to condone or even endorse this kind of conduct. You know, you really didn't hear anything to that effect today. Really, it was sort of condemnation of the riot um, and then sort of a suggestion that it was independent of President Trump's conduct uh, and his words. Um, but I do think that, you know, there could be surprises sort of around the corner uh, as we head into this week. So I'm not sure anything is off the table at this point. Kate Shaw, thank you so much as always for your insight. Turning now to some of our other top stories tonight, including a terrifying and violent attack at a health clinic near Minneapolis. A number of people suffering from gunshot wounds rushed to other hospitals. Authorities found a suspicious package at the location of the shooting and are now searching for a motive. Our Alex Perez has the very latest. Tonight, horror and chaos at this medical center in Buffalo, Minnesota, after a suspect identified by police as 67-year-old Gregory Paul Ulrich allegedly walked into the Alina Health Clinic late this morning and opened fire. Kathy Kurth was right there. I heard this man say, get down on the ground, and I turned and I saw the back of this man and he had a gun. And there were screaming and there was shooting. Another woman was dropping off her mom at the clinic. I was just getting ready to drop her off at the door and two of the nurses came running out to my vehicle and got in. Um, they said they heard about 11 shots within a minute. Federal and local law enforcement rushing to the scene. Officials say five people were injured in the shooting. We're going to assist uh, with getting some blood runs. Uh, for the shooting victims. Upon our arrival, we also located several several victims in this. It's a it's a horrible looking scene, and uh, our staff immediately began rendering aid to those victims. Authorities saying that a suspicious package was located at the medical center. The bomb squad called in to investigate, and that police also located suspicious devices at a hotel that the suspect had been staying at. We're not looking for any additional suspects. We believe that he acted alone. So the thought now that this was a lone wolf, Alex Perez joins us now. Alex, what more can you tell us about the case? Yeah, Lindsay, still so many unknowns in this case, including what exactly the motive may have been. But authorities say this suspect is no stranger to law enforcement. They say he has a history of run-ins. They believe he specifically targeted this clinic or someone who worked there. He's doing court on Thursday. Lindsay? Alex Perez, thanks so much. Now we shift to the mad dash and frustrations when it comes to getting our nation vaccinated. Today, the Biden administration stepping up their rollout efforts, saying that they will ensure rural and undeserved, underserved communities will not be left behind. ABC's Marcus Moore brings us the latest on the massive vaccination efforts now underway. Tonight, the pace of the vaccine rollout slowly picking up. The federal government sending out an additional 1 million doses this week to 6,500 select pharmacies across the U.S. The expansion, part of a larger strategy by the White House to ensure no one is left behind. Equity means that we are reaching everyone, particularly those in underserved and rural communities and those who have been hit hardest by this pandemic. Walgreens taking appointments today in 13 states and Puerto Rico for vaccinations beginning Friday. As vaccine inventory continues to grow, we'll be able to then ensure that we increase access um, to all of our patients. CVS also expected to begin scheduling appointments Thursday in 11 states, with vaccinations also starting Friday. Some states have already been supplying their pharmacies for weeks. In Houston, Buzz Belmont booked his shots with Sam's Club. I've been online like every day, and today was the first time I've gotten through. 
to get appointments, so I got my husband and I appointments for Friday. So far, 9.8 million fully vaccinated. But across the U.S., there's frustrations over supply shortages, unclaimed second doses, and inconsistent vaccine shipments. Some weeks we get more, some weeks we get less, because that, that, uh, that makes it very hard to schedule. The vaccination effort amidst an urgent race to stop the spread of the new, more contagious variants. The White House saying it has stepped up monitoring. The U.K. variant now reported in at least 39 states. Certainly a race against time as that U.K. variant continues to spread so rapidly. Marcus joins us now. Marcus, where does the White House stand in terms of its initial goal to distribute 100 million doses in those first 100 days? Lindsay, the Biden administration says it will begin sending vaccine supplies uh, directly to community health centers starting next week. Uh, phase one will focus on 250 of those centers with 1 million doses to be uh, uh, to be delivered or administered. And then separately, FEMA says it is planning to send mobile units directly to communities that have been hardest hit. Lindsay. Marcus Moore, our thanks to you. It's been more than a year since we were first told about a mysterious virus infecting people in the city of Wuhan. While there has been much speculation about how COVID originated, the World Health Organization hadn't been given the chance to dig deeper until now. ABC's Ian Panel brings us the latest on the WHO's investigation into the virus that has changed our world. Tonight, an expert team investigating the origin of the pandemic, dismissing theories it escaped from a research lab in China. What we did find is that the lab escape was extremely unlikely. President Trump and his administration repeatedly made unsubstantiated claims the virus was developed here and somehow leaked. Not so, says Peter Daszak, a world-renowned British zoologist who was part of the four-week investigation. The leading theories. It was passed from animals to humans, possibly from bats through an intermediary animal, or was carried in frozen wildlife meat that made its way to a Wuhan market. There were clearly animals in that market in, in the form of frozen uh, carcasses or pieces of meat from animals that are known to carry other coronaviruses close to SARS. That's a significant finding. There's been controversy over China's lack of transparency and repeated delays in giving the team access. The WHO also charged with being too close to Beijing, too political and slow to act. But the team says it was eventually granted full access to all sites and personnel they requested. Ian Panel joins us now. And Ian, the WHO mentions frozen meat as a possible source. Any idea where that meat was brought to the market from? Yeah, first of all, I think it's important to say that it is just one of the theories, but it's certainly one of the key theories. This had been discussed earlier, but didn't seem to acquire much momentum. And then I think it took a number of people by surprise that it was mentioned today. The particular frozen meat they were talking about comes from Southeast Asia, so from countries like Vietnam and Laos, but also parts of China. And with a focus particularly on wild meat, like this animal called a ferret badger, which is farmed for food in parts of Southeast Asia, it's slaughtered. It's frozen and then it's sent to markets like the one in Wuhan. It's also a known carrier of coronavirus. And the theory is that that could have been a way, not that it originated inside that animal, but that it transported the virus to people who then ate it inside China. That's one of the active theories at the moment. And they said very clearly that more investigation now needs to take place inside China and also elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Lindsay? More than one year later, still trying to track down that source. Ian panel our thanks to you and when we come back to dramatic rescue three people stranded on an uninhabited island in the bahamas for 33 days with concerns about those covid variants growing the new warning about counterfeit masks as people try to protect themselves but up next the impeachment is not the end for former president trump's legal troubles our in-depth look at the other investigations now swirling around him With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show. ABC's Good Morning America. He conned his way through love. He was a rock star surgeon. That George Clooney type 
feel sexy. And the wedding of a lifetime. Andrea Bocelli was going to be singing. The guest list just kept growing. The icing on the cake was the Pope was going to marry them. Are you kidding? <laughs> but when he put lives at risk, the con is up. The doctor should be jailed for what he did. If we don't do anything, a lot of people will die. Now, as this doctor faces criminal charges, the 2020 event, Friday night on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. As the Senate impeachment trial gets underway, former President Trump is also facing a number of ongoing state, criminal, and civil investigations into his conduct both before and during his time in the White House. Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. He's out of office, his bid to overturn the election shut down. Now former President Donald Trump faces growing legal scrutiny of his actions. I think it's very possible that in the near future we could see a criminal indictment filed against former President Donald Trump. ABC News has learned Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger has opened the first formal investigation of Trump's phone calls to state officials seeking to overturn the results of the election. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Trump asking Raffensperger to find enough votes to help him win, even though Joe Biden's victory in Georgia had been certified twice. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. I identified three criminal statutes which I thought were violated. Public interest attorney John Banzaff filed a series of complaints in Georgia that triggered the new investigation, outlining in a letter to state officials what he says are clear violations of state law. Conspiracy to commit election fraud, solicitation to commit election fraud, uh, intentional interference with an election official. Do you think that this will be pursued ultimately? I like to think that the Georgia officials will do what the law requires, that they will do a thorough investigation, and if they do, I think they will conclude that there has been a violation of criminal statutes and proceed accordingly. Trump's attorneys deny the call was inappropriate, saying in their impeachment defense to the U.S. Senate that the president was simply expressing his opinion and did not threaten Raffensperger. But Fulton County's top prosecutor, District Attorney Fonnie Willis, says what she's heard is disturbing and that if election officials refer the case to her, she'll pursue it aggressively. Uh, I know D.A. Willis, and she will move it as fast as possible but she's not going to move it forward just to satisfy anyone, Democrat, Republican. If she pursues this, I mean, we're talking potentially years of investigation, legal uh, proceedings, um, and an uncertain outcome. I have never seen anything like this. People in Georgia don't like to be messed with. So I, I don't think he's gonna find a friendly audience here uh, if they do decide to go forward on this case. Raffensperger rebuffed Trump, the state's vote certified for Joe Biden. And four days after that call, the president held a rally to challenge the electoral count. We fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Trump urging his supporters on January 6th to converge on the U.S. Capitol. We're going to walk down to the Capitol 
because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength. The peaceful demonstration turned violent and deadly. Members of Congress scrambling for safety. At least five Americans were killed, including a Capitol Police officer. Trump was impeached by the House for incitement of the insurrection. But now with that Senate trial underway, local prosecutors are deciding whether to charge him with a crime. Under D.C. law, inciting violence is a misdemeanor offense, and it's my office's responsibility to investigate whether those words exceeded the First Amendment protection and went into a zone of criminality um, for inciting the mob that charged the Capitol. Oh, there we go. At least 14 of the alleged insurrectionists now facing criminal charges have since said they were following Trump's encouragement, according to an ABC News analysis of court documents and news reports. The president's lawyer insists the mob acted on its own. Just because somebody gave a speech and um, and got and people got excited, that, that doesn't mean that the speechmaker's fault. It's the people who got excited and and did what they know is wrong. The probes of Trump's post-election conduct joined several other civil and criminal investigations of Trump and his family business well underway. We're getting documents each and every day. Um, we are, again, seeking the testimony of certain individuals. We are reviewing all of those documents. It's uh, thousands and thousands of documents. New York Attorney General Letitia James has been scrutinizing whether Trump manipulated the value of some of his real estate holdings for tax and insurance purposes, zeroing in on at least four properties in three states. States. Do you expect to depose the former president in this matter? At this point in time, we do not expect to depose the president of the United States, but all of um, the options are on the table. It's important to know that this investigation is not based on politics. It's based on the law and the evidence. The investigation is not going to change simply because uh, Donald Trump is now a private citizen. Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance also continuing his criminal probe into possible bank, tax, and insurance fraud by the Trump Organization. Trump's attorneys deny wrong doing and call both New York probes politically motivated. And they've asked the U.S. Supreme Court for a second time to block release of his tax returns. A decision is imminent. And the president's alleged fraud numbers in the tens of millions of dollars. Certainly, it looks to me like the president has some exposure to potential jail time. And still facing fallout from allegations of sexual misconduct dating back decades, Trump could soon face deposition under oath. I do. A judge recently allowing the defamation case of Trump accuser and former Elle magazine writer E. Jean Carroll to move forward. As her attorney, Roberta Kaplan, vows to challenge the former president over his history of false and misleading statements. When we depose you, you're not going to get away with that, Kaplan told the Washington Post. He had the mantle of the presidency, and now that's gone. On. I have no idea who this woman is. This is a woman who's also accused other men of things, as you know. Uh, it is a totally false accusation. I think the fact that the Republicans are likely not to vote to convict Trump in the impeachment is all the more reason why, if he committed violations of the law, as I think he did in Georgia and may have in New York and other places, that he should be prosecuted for them. Otherwise, he gets off scot-free. The investigations and possible prosecutions of a former American president are unprecedented. Uncharted legal territory for Trump as that political showdown in the Senate gets underway. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. So this could just be the beginning, or thanks to Devin for that. For more on the impeachment of former President Trump and the future of the Republican Party, let's bring in Illinois Republican Representative Adam Kinzinger. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Congressman. You now, you, of course, voted to impeach President Trump in the House. I understand that you were watching the proceedings today. By all accounts, the consensus is that the House impeachment managers did a better job making their argument. They won over one additional Republican, Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy. What did you make of the arguments from both sides today? Yeah, you know, I uh, had it on the background, watched as much of it as I could, and, and I, I would agree with that assessment. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious uh, by the defense that they were brought on about a week ago. Uh, that was pretty clear. 
Uh, and I think from the prosecution side of things, they did their homework. I think the video at the beginning was very impactful. And, and it's important to see because I think over the last month, we've lost the rawness of what happened and we've allowed, you know, whataboutism and, and false equivalence to, to cloud our judgment. But seeing that firsthand was some of the things people were saying. You couldn't at least deny that people were there for what they thought was Trump's mark in orders, but, you know, obviously there's going to be debate over whether he bears blame. This is a crystal ball kind of question, of course, but do you think that it's likely, not just possible, but likely that more Republican senators will ultimately change their minds in the coming days as they hear more arguments, or is this a foregone conclusion? You know, I'm going to have to say probably not likely, but possible. And it, it just depends, I guess, on how this goes, how public pressure is. Politicians are, you know, naturally very receptive to what people are telling them, their constituents. And so I think if the, the general American public reacts to what they're seeing with horror and, and, and with a belief that he needs removed, as I believe, then I think it's quite possible. But unfortunately, I think politics has so much clouded everything that even something as important as this, uh, it's hard for people to take a vote outside of what the political implications are. So you don't have the perception necessarily that this is a rigged jury here? I, you know, I guess I, I kind of feel like it may be slightly rigged because people have already kind of made up their decision, but I do think there's a possibility uh, over the next few whatever days that, that we could pick up some more. I think it's highly unlikely, though, that you get 17 Republicans to remove Donald Trump. Now, you, of course, penned an op-ed in the Washington Post this week saying, my fellow Republicans convicting Trump is necessary to save America. You went on to say that this isn't a waste of time, it's a matter of accountability. What inspired you to write this op-ed, and if there is no conviction are you worried about more hate-inspired violence in the near future? I am worried about all of it. Uh, so on countryfirst.com with a 1ST, I did a video which basically kind of puts out what this op-ed even goes further on, which is the Republican Party used to be great. We've lost our way, and we have a real choice to make. And I think that's where fighting for the soul of the party is really where that fight is. What is it we're going to stand for? And I think we have fed too much for too long into people's fears and anxieties to win elections, and it's high time people get inspired again by the great country we are. And, uh, and I think over time, people are going to wake up to really how bad at least the tone was in the last four years, particularly January 6th. And I don't think history is going to judge too kindly those that stood by and, and, and picked politics over that oath-keeping decision. You say you've received an outpouring of support after your impeachment vote. I'd imagine some threats as well. In the closed-door House Republican meeting last week, the party voted overwhelmingly in private to keep Liz Cheney in leadership despite her impeachment vote. Do you think that the Senate impeachment vote would be different if it was in private? Certainly. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I think it's very telling. I had said even before the Liz Cheney vote that you know, I thought if it was a secret ballot, you could get upwards of 100 Republicans. But, you know, on the one hand, it's sad, right, because this is such a serious vote. On the other hand, you know, they're reflecting the districts. They're worried about the politics of it. But this is not a moment, you know, maybe if you have to make a decision on Obamacare or taxes. This is that oath-keeping thing. And only one person in my district, the 750,000, had to swear an oath to the Constitution in this capacity. That person's me. I'm the only one responsible for whether or not the Constitution was violated, and I certainly think it was. And lastly, when we had your colleague, Representative Matt Gates, on our show, he suggested to us, in his eyes, there's no place in the Republican Party for House members like you who voted for impeachment. Does your vision of the future of the Republican Party include people like him? Well, no, not if you keep saying stuff like that. Uh, you know, he's obviously a, uh, somebody that just wants to be famous, so I would expect him to moderate if the party did so. But uh, if we think we can pick up more proud boys and white supremacists to make up for conservatives like me that actually just believe in this country, uh, it'll be a forever minority party. And so uh, I think you'll see his tone change when people start waking up and demanding better. Just one more for you. Would you consider it all leaving your party if you feel that your views are falling on deaf ears? Not today. Uh, I've determined to fight for my party. But if it continues down this track and there's no hope for it, I, I certainly wouldn't be able to stay under the Republican banner as much as I want to. You know, I, I need to be associated with a party that's optimistic about the future. And uh, I'm not there yet. I'm going to fight for the soul of this party. 
Uh, and down the road, hopefully, that won't be a decision I'll have to make. Congressman Adam Kinzinger, we thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you talking with us tonight. You bet. See you. Still ahead here on Prime, the NTSB report, who they say is to blame for the crash that killed NBA legend Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven others. So many parents desperately want their children back in the classroom, but many teachers are terrified about exposing themselves to COVID. What will it take to get schools to reopen nationwide? And the call being made by grocery workers for hazard pay or for all states to put them in the front of the line for vaccinations as so many continue to catch COVID. We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day. Very nervous, but very excited. She's a social media sensation. I'm Claudia Conway. My parents are high profile political figures. But will she get a ticket to Hollywood? We want an American Idol. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. He conned his way through love. He was a rock star surgeon. That George Clooney type of feel, sexy. And the wedding of a lifetime. Andrea Bocelli was going to be singing. The guest list just kept growing. The icing on the cake was the Pope was going to marry them. Are you kidding? But when he put lives at risk, the con is up. The doctor should be jailed for what he did. If we don't do anything, a lot of people will die. Now, as this doctor faces criminal charges, the 2020 event, Friday night on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. While grocery store and meatpacking employees have been considered essential workers on the front lines of the pandemic, a powerful union said today that they aren't being given enough priority in getting a COVID-19 vaccine and called for more hazard pay for those frontline workers keeping America fed. Let's take a look by the numbers. While vaccine access has expanded in recent weeks, just 13 states currently have vaccine access for grocery store workers, and 12 states are allowing meatpacking workers to get early access to a COVID vaccine, according to data compiled by the New York Times. The United Food and Commercial Workers Union, which represents 1.3 million workers nationwide, argue that grocery store meatpacking and other food service workers are still feeling the stress and fear of contracting the virus at work and should be given priority. And the risks are certainly very real. According to the union, more than 30,000 grocery store workers have been infected or exposed to COVID-19, and 137 have died during the pandemic. At least 282 meatpacking workers have died from COVID since the pandemic began, according to data from the Food and Environment Reporting Network. The union is also pushing grocery store chains to bring back hazard pay, as many had early on in the pandemic. Seattle recently passed a $4 pay hike mandate for large grocery stores in the city. 
City, and other cities are also seeking to require a boost in hazard pay at the union's urging. And while many grocery store chains have ended hazard pay, Trader Joe's this month said that its 10,000 workers nationwide will get a boost to $4 an hour in hazard pay. Still, lots ahead here tonight on Prime, including teachers' unions versus school boards, parents versus teachers. What will it take to get classrooms reopened? And celebrating the life of a supreme pioneer. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big, big hug, Rich. We tell all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. He conned his way through love. He was a rock star surgeon. That George Clooney type of feel, sexy. And the wedding of a lifetime. Andrea Bocelli was going to be singing. The guest list just kept growing. The icing on the cake was the Pope was going to marry them. Are you kidding me? But when he put lives at risk, the con is up. The doctor should be jailed for what he did. If we don't do anything, a lot of people will die. Now, as this doctor faces criminal charges, the 2020 event, Friday night on ABC. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Congressional Democrats kicking off the first day of Donald Trump's second impeachment trial for incitement of insurrection, showing the timeline of how Trump fed a mob of his supporters lies about the 2020 presidential election being stolen. Fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Motivated them the and sent them towards the Capitol to fight. Senators, this cannot be our future. But Trump's defense team already arguing that same evidence will exonerate the former president. We can't be thinking about that. We can't possibly be suggesting that we punish people for political speech in this country. And after four hours of arguments, six Republicans siding with Democrats. Voting the trial should move forward. Horror and chaos at this medical center in Buffalo, Minnesota, after a suspect identified by police as 67-year-old Gregory Paul Ulrich allegedly walked into the Alina Health Clinic late this morning and opened fire. I heard this man say, get down on the ground, and they were screaming and they were shooting. Officials say five people were injured in the shooting. Authorities saying that a suspicious package was located at the medical center. The bomb squad called in to investigate and that police also located suspicious devices at a hotel that the suspect had been staying at. We believe that he acted alone. 
A welcome rescue for three people stranded on an uninhabited Bahamian island, stuck there for 33 days. The U.S. Coast Guard says a helicopter on routine patrol spotted them on Anguilla Cay, located between Key West and Cuba. For nearly five weeks, the trio lived off of coconuts. The rescue party dropped them supplies, including a radio, water, and food, hopefully no coconuts. They were hospitalized, but no serious injuries. Hundreds of thousands of N95 masks meant for some Washington state medical personnel now being pulled off the shelves. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security sending an alert that fraudulent N95 masks have been found mixed into the supply chain across the country. The Washington State Hospital Association sending major N95 manufacturer 3M photographs and lot numbers of masks bought from a distributor being told they bought fakes. They look... They feel, they breathe, they fit like a 3M mask. In 2020, Homeland Security investigation showing GMA some confiscated counterfeits like these. And the differences? The quality of the inside of the mask is not as good. The state of Washington backfilling the lost masks. 3M expediting more than a million respirators to them. Her voice helped define what it meant to be Motown. And now we are saying goodbye to one of the co-founders of the Supremes. The world is stopping to remember Motown great Mary Wilson. A publicist says she died suddenly, and it comes just days after the Motown group with lead singer Diana Ross marked its 60th anniversary. We came from a time when, as black people, it wasn't, you didn't dream about becoming a star. You didn't dream about making money. It was all about the being a human being, being respected, being equal. Mary Wilson was 76 years old. Welcome back. Tonight, a new NTSB report is putting the blame on the pilot for the fatal crash that killed NBA icon Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven others. The report blamed him for flying in bad weather and says that he became disoriented just before the crash. It says that the pilot thought he was climbing to get above the clouds, but was in fact descending. And now to the battle over reopening America's schools. With more than 40% of children in the U.S. still learning remotely, officials are now facing off against some teachers unions over how to safely get kids back in class. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. Rashawn Sivaraj is one of the millions of American children who haven't been in a classroom since March. I want schools to be open, but I don't know when they are going to be open because of COVID. Rashawn's dad, Siva, is a single father of two and worries about the lasting impact of virtual learning. My oldest is the one I'm most worried about. He's really struggled uh, to find motivation in school. I mean, he's borderline depressed. He goes from his bed to his gaming station. He used to be uh, on a student and his grades just drop right drop bottom. The contentious battle over reopening America's schools is heating up from coast to coast. Things especially tense in San Francisco. City and district leaders going head to head, reaching a breaking point last week. San Francisco city officials sued their own district and school board in an effort to get those students back in classrooms. We're not here to be divisive. We're not here to point the fingers. We're here to ask you, to beg you, to work with us, to continue to work with us and get our schools open. Teachers unions and district officials on Sunday coming to a compromise in a tentative agreement to resume in-person learning, something many parents and students have been calling for. Thank you for being here. Please maintain social distance. And Meredith Willa Dobson is the co-founder of Decreasing the Distance, a parent collective that's been working since summertime to see schools reopen. She helped organize this march over the weekend. It's been clear that as we're, we're approaching quickly a year into the pandemic, with these kids learning from home for that whole time, um, and we're seeing real impacts. Kevin Robinson agreeing, saying remote learning is just not working for his son. Of a seven hour day, he's doing about seven, about one hour worth of, of learning. I mean, this is San Francisco, it's February, and it's beautiful out here. We could have had outdoor schooling since day one. 
It's not rocket science. But teachers we spoke with say it's not so simple. We want to feel supported by the city, not attacked by the city. We're being asked to put ourselves on the line as frontline workers, but aren't being prioritized in the vaccination rollout in the way that many people think we should be. About half of states are now giving vaccine priority to some or all teachers. The new agreement in San Francisco will allow classrooms to open when the city drops to red tier COVID levels, the second most restrictive level of California's reopening blueprint. If on-site staff are given access to COVID-19 shots, and if the city progresses to the orange tier with moderate virus spread, staff have agreed to go back without vaccinations. Right now, San Francisco is still in the purple tier, the most restrictive. In San Francisco is the infrastructure. School buildings here are old. They don't have proper ventilation. There needs to be um, adequate supplies to keep everybody clean and safe at school. California has been hit hard during the pandemic. A large number of its 6 million public school children have not been in a classroom since March of last year. Nationwide, more than 117,000 new COVID-19 cases were reported in children last week alone. In total, nearly 3 million American kids have been diagnosed since the pandemic began. But the CDC says opening schools can be safe with proper precautions. The data from schools suggests that there's very little transmission that is happening within the schools, especially when there's masking and distancing occurring. I'm not less worried because we have data, we have more examples of how other districts are opening safely. ABC News contributor Dr. John Brownstein of Boston Children's Hospital says it's also important to consider the mental and emotional impact of virtual learning. What impact does virtual learning have on the mental well-being of children and, and their development? Yeah, I think especially as you look at uh, children in, in the early, earlier grades, they're mostly the ones that are impacted by this virtual learning. Uh, they are not getting the same type of attention and care that they would do in an in-person environment. 11-year-old Iris Martinez and 10-year-old Alondra Margarito tell us they're struggling with learning online. I don't learn that much and I get distracted easily by my background noise and since I don't have that much space in my house, sometimes it's difficult to understand the teacher if like, my internet is not working that much. The Stanford Center for Research on Education Outcomes estimates the average American student has already lost half a year of learning in reading and over a full year of learning in math since the pandemic began. And we're seeing clashes over school openings across the country. Teachers in Chicago threatened to strike over COVID concerns. Sunday, they reached a tentative agreement with the city to start bringing some students back this week. Fears and frustrations have been heard. In Philadelphia, educators have protested to demand safer working conditions. We're asking that everybody come back to school in a safe school. On Monday, the city announced a joint effort with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to vaccinate teachers. Los Angeles also has no clear path to reopening. City Council Member Joe Buscano threatening to sue the L.A. Unified School District, the second largest public school system in the U.S. Threats of lawsuits, finger pointing and speech making won't help. Let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. And back in San Francisco, it's still unclear when the first students will be in classrooms once again. That tentative agreement between the teachers unions and the district still needs to be ratified, which is expected next week. Lindsay? The stalemate continues in so many areas across the country are thanks to you, Rena. And when we come back, if you have not seen this, prepare for a chuckle. The court hearing and the Zoom cat filter, what could go wrong? Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. He conned his way through love. He was a rock star surgeon. That George Clooney type of feel, sexy. And the wedding of a lifetime. Andrea Bocelli was going to be singing. The guest list just kept growing. The icing on the cake was the Pope was going to marry them. Are you kidding me? But when he put lives at risk, the con is up. The doctor should be jailed for what he did. If we don't do anything, a lot of people will die. Now, as this doctor faces criminal charges, the 2020 event, Friday night on ABC. Do you
The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Finally tonight, after a day of hearing from lawyers in Washington, here's an attorney in Brewster County, Texas, attempting to appear at a virtual hearing, but having a bit of a technical difficulty. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to... Uh, uh -huh. Take we're trying look. to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. I am not a cat. That video has since gone viral, but the lawyer is taking it all in stride, saying in an interview, stuff happens. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.